I guess we're live. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone on the internet, on YouTube, on Google+. Uh, I am Amy Robinson, and I'm here with an amazing group of mathematics rock stars from all over the world. We are here for the Science on Google Plus Hangout on Air series, and we're going to talk about GIFs or GIFs, depending on how you pronounce them. Uh, we'll talk about how mathematics kind of shapes and explains the world that we live in, and hear from real mathematicians why they're interested in all these numbers and what sense they make out of the world from their extra knowledge. So uh, we're about to go into really quick, uh, I guess, introductions from everyone because this hangout will last for about a half an hour. So I'm Amy Robinson and I'm with Science on Google Plus and I am hosting this hangout here from MIT's Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. So I'm not a mathematician. I'm a little bit intimidated by you guys, you geniuses on the hangout here. We're very intimidating as you can yeah. <laughs> We're very into it. <laughs> <laughs> so I work in the neuroscience lab at MIT, and we are, uh, with the help of about 100,000 gamers around the world, mapping the brain. And, then, and I'm an avid Google Plus user, and I love the you know, the idea of Hangouts and starting conversations with scientists from all over the world in real time. Uh, and we are running the Q&A app during this Hangout, so if you're watching live, feel free to add your comments and uh, some of our genius brains here can address them for you. Uh-oh. <laughs> so maybe we should go from uh, from me to the left and just start with Vincent and have everyone do a quick introduction. Cool, so yeah, I'm, I, I'm Vince. Uh, I'm a, a mathematician from Cardiff University in, in Wales. Uh, um, I like to study uh, game theory and queuing theory, and so like how how people should act in queues and that kind of thing. Um, I uh, like Google Plus way too much; spend far too much time on it. And um, yeah, I, uh, I'm I, I'm the one that's suffering from the time the time lag, the, the jet lag in this one because it's it's about two a.m. here. So, but I, I won't make a big deal of that. <laughs> you just did. Fly, by the way. <laughs> that's, that's my catchphrase. <laughs> so, well, so do you Vince, need to spend extra points for being okay? <laughs> Vince, for us Americans, the Q means line, right? Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like line, lines yeah. at the grocery store, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, is it my turn? Uh, Sarah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let's go along the line. <laughs> messing up the queue, man. <laughs> my my order is different from hers. Yeah, How many it, different it orders is. Do I we think it's different. Uh, Vince, I think I'm, we're gonna need your skills now because we need some queuing. <laughs> oh, just wait patiently. Okay, so there's, there's my eight name factorial is. Factorial possible arrangements of the queue. <laughs> my name is Sarah Del Valle. I'm a scientist. <laughs> at Los Alamos National Lab. Um, I have a PhD in applied mathematics and I study the spread of infectious diseases. So I work with both mathematical and computational models and I also study social networks and I most recently I've been using Twitter, Wikipedia and other social media to study um, how we can monitor disease spread uh, through social media and also how we can monitor behavior that can impact disease spread. Awesome. Awesome. And it's uh, 6 p.m. here in New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop going on about the times. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't had dinner yet. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So Robert, we're just going along the line at the bottom of the screen. I don't know if you guys can see. Oh, this. am I next? You would be next. Okay, I'm. I'm. Oh, hold on. Giraffe I'm Robert enthusiast. Jacobson. Robert Jacobson. I'm, I'm assistant professor of mathematics at Roger Williams University, and I study complex analysis. Which um, so I I tell my students that complex analysis is is like calculus, but with complex numbers and in many dimensions. That's what I study is several complex variables. Um, but that doesn't really sort of convey what that means to people because it's so kind of esoteric and nonsensical to most people. Um, and my research is on this like really esoteric widget, this, this thing in complex analysis that nobody's ever heard of. 
Um, so that's what I do. <laughs> this this oh, thing, this movie yeah. that no one's ever heard of. So uh, I'm in Rhode Island, and I think it's like eight it. here. <laughs> Now's your chance to tell the whole world what your widget is, dude. Oh, right. uh, Bergman kernel function. <laughs> I, I studied the Bergman kernel function. Bergman kernel function. Google it. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> it looks like Luis next to me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, I just wanted to double check. Yeah, I'm, I'm Luis Guzman, and I am a systems analyst and mathematics graduate student. I attend the University of West Florida. I have interest in matrix theory and graph theory. Um, sort of in between careers, I've um, been a senior analyst for about 12 years now. Uh, and you get to work with all kinds of interesting things in programming environments and things of that nature. But I uh, got my interest in mathematics when I was attending the University of Tennessee for my Master's of Computer Science. and took a proof-based class and decided to change majors. Just fell in love with the, the beauty and the connections that I saw with math and decided to say, uh, you know, I think that that's where my interest would lie. So I'm hoping that I can get my master's soon and maybe one day pursue a PhD if I have the time. I've, I have two kids, so I don't, I don't know if I can pursue that yet. But uh, and, and eventually uh, teach at the college level and I'll get to see all the interesting conversations, you know, that uh, David and uh, Dana and everyone else who has out there with uh, uh, being professors out there and uh, it, it's really inspiring. Nice. Nice. Awesome. I'm glad to have you on hang out with us. Thank you. Jason. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I have a mustache because it's November. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you. That was a good joke, wasn't it? <laughs> My, when I teach, my students laugh about that much, too. Um, so I am a PhD student at the University of Waterloo, and I am in the Earth Science Department, so I do numerical modeling and uh, fluid mechanics, and I also do a little bit of geostatistics. So I'm not exactly a mathematician, but I do apply that. Uh, I'm also one of the other curators in science at Google+. Plus. But what was the official number, Amy, that we said? Just slightly, oh. slightly less than half a million people. Yes, yes. So this is a joint hangout between Science on Google Plus and the Mathematics community, which are both very large communities on Google Plus. And together, we have almost half a million plus ones. Um, and even, we have over half a million wow. plus ones in our, uh, in our followers. Yeah, so it's just a testament to the, the quality of the environment, I think, uh, on the, the Google Plus platform, for sure. We're killing it. <laughs> <laughs> nice work. Awesome. I think it's me. Mm-hmm. I'm taking my eye patch off. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's I getting serious now. <laughs> so uh, I'm Dan Rice. I'm a teacher professor of math at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, I study algebra, combinatorics, and also a little bit of math education. I'm very interested in inquiry-based learning. And basically, I'm interested in anything that involves patterns and symmetry, I like puzzles, I like games, and because I'm not very smart, I actually uh, like to draw pictures of as many things as possible. So most of my research involves sort of visualizations and some sort of diagrammatic representations like like that stuff. Nice. Ooh. What is that back there? Uh, that actually is going to be completely made it up. Students recently worked yeah. <laughs> so that's a, uh, a picture of a factorization of a temporally lead algebra diagram. Of course. Uh, that's, oh. that's, that's obvious from the colors. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> there's colors over there. And then there's some calculus over there, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. There's some geometry. <laughs> Plus, I think it's sort of a good segue for us to kind of get started and just, just starting the conversation about why math is so awesome. So I, today, at MIT, wore my geekiest shirt that I own. It's my favorite shirt. Um, and it intimidates me because all these people who are good at math talk to me. But my shirt says, what is the most beautiful equation? And so I want to pose this to you mathematicians. What is the most beautiful equation? 
I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in with the, the popular response, which is Euler's equation, um, and it's often, often called the most beautiful one because of the fact that it has a lot of mathematical symbols in it, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if others would, would actually say the same. That was probably what we're pre-programmed to say. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Euler's equation. I mean, the, it's, and, and, and not just that, but there's, there's, there's connections in complex analysis to some other interesting ideas there. Um, you know, just just the geometric notion of complex numbers, for example, um, is present in present in, in Euler's Euler's formula, Euler's equation, um, and that's interesting to me as a complex analyst. Somebody should write Euler's formula on a, on a sheet of paper. And uh, I'm yeah, doing no, it no. now. I'm doing it now. I'm not sure if it's going to be any good, though. Oh, that's awful. Oh, you have it wrong, okay, Ben. Wait. I don't. Do I have it wrong? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, that's right. <laughs> e r pi <laughs> equals negative one. So mathematicians right. ex explain this to non-mathematician viewers. Oh, <laughs> that's so beautiful. I think, I think we have to defer to the complex analyst. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on it. Just say it. Talk amongst yourselves. It's trivial. <laughs> it's trivial. <laughs> <laughs> So it's left us as an exercise for the students. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I, hear, I heard crickets. <laughs> Robert's really going to town. You better be drawing a really Robert. good picture. <laughs> Robert, do you want me to fill this silence? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got Is it. Time it. To I got it. Yet? <laughs> yeah. So. so. <laughs> So before we got you guys actually on this call, we we mentioned that this hangout was going to be, uh, you know, featuring GIFs and XKCD comics uh, in order to kind of bring math into a tangible, 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 fathomable uh, concept that people can apply towards what they're actually experiencing out there in the world. So we included a link to a specific XKCD comic. Uh, in the actual event page that I'm going to post up here on the screen. And I believe that Vince is going to voice narrate for us. What? <laughs> yep, yep. So Vince is going to read this out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to explain why it's funny. Are you guys ready? <laughs> Hold on. I just, this is the I just, when I wasn't listening and I heard, oh, we'll get Vince to say it because it's accent. Okay. All right. <laughs> this is our pre-planning of the <laughs> So I'm going to share my screen, and Vince, I just posted it in the uh, in the chat. All right. In the you can find it. Um. <laughs> or you can just look at my screen because it's up on my screen right now. Oh, yeah. Let's see if I can see it on... So, okay, oh, so... Amy, Amy, make yourself the, the screen. I have, yes. Yeah, cool. Oh, there it is. I see it. Uh, Amy, make yourself... So you guys just want me to act this out, or...? <laughs> <laughs> With the sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me get the sound effects ready. <laughs> so what did you... I carved a pumpkin. Taking on teen vandals, I see. Hold on, I can't see that. Heavens no, my pumpkin simply has chest pains. In fact, I'll leave a note warning them not to smash it. My pumpkin's name is Harold. He just realized that all the time he used to spend daydreaming, he now spends worrying. He'll try to distract himself later with holiday traditions, but it won't work. I carved and carved, and the next thing I knew, I had two pumpkins. I told you not to take the axiom of choice. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite one. I love the lol. <laughs> so we, we have to explain this, why it's funny. Yeah. So I don't really get it. <laughs> we, okay. we need an animated GIF. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna put it for you. So, so there's this theorem that says that you can take a sphere and you can cut it up into a finite number of pieces, disassemble that sphere, and then reassemble it into two spheres of the same volume. 
Okay. So, so and let me let me say that again because you might not have understood what I meant. So you have a sphere of one volume, right? And then you're gonna chop it up. And then you're gonna take those pieces and put them back together, and you have two spheres of the same volume as your original sphere. As your But that, that that brings up another another thing that we've we've talked about before amongst ourselves is that like I don't know that theorem. So when I looked at that XQZE comic, it, it was one of those that I went, oh wow, I I don't I don't get that either. So <laughs> it's, I, I, think, I think it's the fact that you know uh, mathematics is quite is quite diverse, and that as we as we specialize into our own fields, there are parts that I don't know. So that, that that's a completely new theorem that I've just learned from Robert, and, and, and my mind has gone, wow, how, the, <laughs> how does that work? How are we making stuff out of nothing, right? Yeah. Um, but I guess that's that's just. So, so Robert, the, can you sketch the, the proof? Robert cited. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sketch the proof, Robert. You have two minutes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll, let me sketch. I'll, I'll put I'll this back up, Robert. Right I'll distract him with this. It's okay. I'll distract him with this. <laughs> so the uh, theorem that Robert cited is an instance of the Bonnach-Tarski paradox, which I just put in the chat window. <laughs> Monarch Parsky paradox. Parsky paradox. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So uh, there's a there's a great Wikipedia page on it. I'm I'm sure. I just I just That's... yeah I just posted the link in our chat window. I know the viewers can't see it. I yeah. just posted it on the event page. But so, if you just go to Wikipedia and search Bonarch Tarski, you'll you see don't it. even have to spell mm -hmm. it. Yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs> Google will correct it for you. But just to, just to go off of what Vince said, I mean, Vince. So so Vince does some research in, in operations research. That's his area of study. I do research in complex analysis. Vince's re, Vince's research is, will not necessarily be intelligible to me. So if I read his research papers, I I might not understand them. And and likewise with me, you know, he might not be able to understand. More that. likely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <that's> more likely. <laughs> or, or Dana or anyone else in this chat. Yeah, yeah, and I won't understand either of theirs. <laughs> yeah. Right. Although Vince and my kind of research is yeah. more applicable. So if you, I mean, you get sick, right? You get the flu, and um, so some of the stuff that we do, I think, is very applicable. And Vince works with like hospital queuing systems, and how do you? Distribute uh, limited resources, and and so I think the application is very um, <laughs> the application. It's it's something that anyone can relate to, but perhaps the details of the of the analysis might not be understandable by the average person. Yeah, that's a good point. So so when you meet someone at a party, Sarah, and they say, "What do you do?" You say, "I'm I'm an, I'm a mathematician." And I, I study um, you know, epidemics, diseases, right? How they mm -hmm. spread and what we can do about it. When I go to a party and someone asks me what I do, I say, I'm a mathematician. I could tell you what I do, but, <laughs> but I you feel don't stupid. Know. No, I can't I can't even say that. Because then I feel like this huge jerk that's trying to be pretentious, right? <laughs> so then what do I do? Do I try to explain it and like they don't they don't know what I'm talking about and they think I'm a jerk because I'm I'm talking down to them? Or do I like say I do something really weird and I can't really explain it because then they think I'm a jerk again because because yeah. you know I'm not yeah. trying to explain it. So what do I do, Sarah? You tell me. Well, I think you need to come up with your, an elevator speech <laughs> of what you do. Yeah. And yeah. Tell them that you do what Sarah does, and they'll leave you alone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually have one. To be honest, I've, I've thought about this quite a bit. And I, what I tell people is, I, I say, I study blobs in space and the kinds of functions that can live on those blobs. And most people can pretend like they know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say you're a giraffe enthusiast? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, even even though what I do is quite applied, I still have the same problem. As soon as I say, "Oh yeah, I I, I do," I, like my first thing is I say I'm a mathematician usually, and then I think I get the thing that we probably all get, which is, like, "Ooh, I can't do math," you know? Yeah, exactly. You must be really smart. And then, 
<laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. And little then, do they know. Exactly. Little do they know. We're just really good at pretending. <laughs> where's, where's but, the... but what's interesting is if you tell a child that you're a mathematician. So I was talking to like a seven-year-old. And I said, I'm a mathematician. And uh, the girl was like, how many additions and subtractions do you know? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, that's, no, that's not just children. Oh, I mean, that's the, not amount, <laughs> the amount of people that think that i just really good at adding big numbers together. And I'm like, I, I can't add numbers. I, I haven't seen a number for years, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> the only numbers I use are 1, 3, 2, 8, times. <laughs> An N. <laughs> I only use zeros and ones, so. <laughs> You're even worse. So what is it that we do? I mean, what is it? Like, people are watching this, and we're talking. We know we're laughing because we know it's true. But, but what is it that we do, right? I mean, how do we how do we say what we do? When 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 I go to work in, in the morning, I okay. I'm also a teacher, so I teach I teach college classes. So people understand what that means. But yeah. but when I do research. What I do is I wake up in the morning and I and I go to my desk and I get a blank piece of paper and a pen and I write something down and I think about it really hard and I stare at it for maybe an hour or two. Yeah. And then after the hour or two I erase it because it was wrong. <laughs> like that's, and then I cry. And then, and then I cry <laughs> and I throw it away and, and like I just iterate that process and that's like what it looks like. I mean now what's actually going on is I have this whole body of knowledge, um, a whole literature exists, I have textbooks that I read and journal articles that I read, and then I take this knowledge and I try to do new things with it, things that no one's ever done before. I try to think new thoughts, put them together in different ways, and come up with facts that people didn't know were true before. And so that's what I do when I do math research. That's what it looks like. That's awesome. So speaking of new thoughts, we have a question from one of the live stream viewers named Akinola Emanuel, and he asks kind of a, a philosophical question about math. And what he asks is, is math a feature of the universe or a feature of human creation? Oh. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's touching on the foundations of mathematics. Yeah. Yeah. This is in the neighborhood of, is mathematics invented or discovered? Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Depends on who you ask. I, I, I like to think that it's both. I mean, certainly yeah. the symbols and the equation that Vince just put up there are, are human-made. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, is the, the idea, the abstract that that equation represents and describes, is that, does that pre-exist us writing it down or not? That's the question. Yeah. I, I like to think from a romantic point of view that it does because it makes my job a lot more... Uh, cool. Interesting. I feel like I'm discovering facts about the universe and, and the nature of being. Uh, if I thought I was just sort of in my office all by myself, working 80s hours a week, making stuff up, it would be less satisfying. <laughs> but I, yeah. I fundamentally do believe that uh, you know we're sort of uncovering uh, intrinsic ideas, facts, abstractions about the universe. Th things that must be true in every possible universe, right? I, th I think. Oh, uh, maybe not. <laughs> Oh, really? I'm open minded about that one. At least they're true here in our model. I, well, but, but if you if you agree with the axioms and you agree with the inference rules, then you must come to the same conclusion. Right? I mean that's that's sort of the foundations of math. Certainly, so you and I could invent an axiom system and apply the rules of inference correctly and it may just be total you know, we could invent a whole field of mathematics called uh, Dinglehopper wikis and yeah. And proof theorems about Dinglehopper wikis. Yeah. yeah. Those ones maybe aren't as intrinsically interesting to people, though. It doesn't seem to model something. I think. Uh, yeah, this is true. I think in the in in the past, I, I I tried to think about that and come up with an opinion about it. You know, is his math invented or not? But I I have to admit, now I I just don't I I. I it's it's for minds much greater than mine to figure that one out. As far as I'm concerned, I I just kind of enjoy it and I just do it and I I don't know. I mean I I thought what you just said, Dana, is really romantic, and I'm like, yeah, that sounds awesome. But I can imagine someone saying something else, and I'm like, yeah, that sounds awesome too. So I, I don't have an opinion on it myself. I my opinion is that the universe can be described uh, with mathematical terms and 
and I think that's that's kind of interesting. <laughs> but I don't really know. I don't know that I have an answer to that question. Yeah, and it it, it you know it depends on who you ask, and I think there's some people that say that we're all politeness when we are young. I'm not that young, but you know I like to think that mathematics is discovered as well, and there's a really cool mathematician, uh, uh, Paul Erdős, who who believed that there was a book that God maintained that had all the perfect proofs out there and most elegant <laughs> proofs of maths, and there's just waiting to be there's this whole underlying uh, theory of it's just stuff that we're uncovering, and it's kind of romantic, like Vincent said, but uh, it's just on who you who you ask. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is oh, it wow. <laughs> oh. oh, I think I'm a three. Uh, Are you a three? No. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm a four. I gotta remember. <laughs> I'm a I'm a five. I'm a five. We should explain what that means. Probably what? nobody knows. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah would be a good person to explain that. So, Amy, do you know what an Erdős number is? Hmm. I'm it's okay. I don't, you don't, know it don't feel stupid. It's okay if you don't. <laughs> so, Erdős was a uh, a mathematician that was, I think, the most prolific uh, mathematician in in history. He published. Does anyone know how many uh, so papers he published? But um, Google, what was, Google Shoot the Google. Uh, I'm really, not sure Erdős was the most prolific. I think uh, Euler was. Euler was, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. But Close I think, enough, though. But he has the most collaborators, I believe. That's, that's and so, and then what's interesting about Erdős is that he would collaborate with like anybody. Yes. You know, his papers. He, if you were uh, doing, I don't know, you know, whatever area of, of science, he would collaborate with you and. And there's stories about him visiting people and not sleeping and not eating, and he just wanted to write papers, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> and so, um, so anyone who who uh, published a paper directly with Erdős is uh, their number is one. So Erdős is zero. And so then, if you publish with someone that published with Erdős, then it's you know you're two, um, two. Two people away from Erdős, and, and so on and so forth, and and so um, uh, my number is four. So my my PhD advisor published with someone that published with someone that published with Erdős. If so. you um, I, I don't know if you want to show this, Amy. I just posted a link to a post by Terence Tao. Terence Tao is a, a very very talented, famous mathematician. He he posts stuff on. Uh, G plus a fair bit, and that that post uh, that link I've got is a post to a photo of Terence Tao with Paul Ordosh when Terence Tao was like twelve or something. He looks really young in that photo. Um, I don't know if you want to put that up so people can see. Yeah, yeah. I am posting on the page right now. So, uh, have you heard of Bacon numbers where you play this game? Yeah, I was thinking this is like. How what's your Kevin? You know how far yeah, away yeah. are you from it's Kevin? Just, yeah, yeah, but they, they stole it from the Erdős numbers. <laughs> <laughs> That's not funny. That's not funny. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> One of my collaborators has the lowest uh, uh, Erdős Bacon Bigfoot number. Bigfoot. <laughs> I heard Bigfoot. I haven't heard of the, heard of the, heard of the Bigfoot number. Bigfoot. The, the Bigfoot number is if you've been in a stadium or on a show or an expedition with the big monster truck Bigfoot. Ah, okay. <laughs> so my, my bacon number is three. Oh, oh your bacon wow. number is smaller than your Erdish number? It is. Oh, my That's gosh. Crazy. So Sarah so has your, an Erdish bacon your, number of seven. Yeah. Yeah, it is seven. Mine's not finite. <laughs> no, mine's not finite either. But I've got a. Uh, my boss and I, we help, Paul Harper and I, we uh, supervise a PhD student who has been an extra in a movie. And so, as being an extra, he actually does have a finite bacon number. And as a result, he has a finite Erdos bacon number. <laughs> yeah, I was in the movie The Avengers. I was an extra. So. Ah, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> hey, can can we can I uh, answer this question about? The Euler equation. <laughs> <laughs> Music, please. <laughs> okay. So. Um... <laughs>
Euler's equation comes from de Moffre's equation. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly because I'm an American. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is what it looks like. And this formula is a way of talking about complex numbers. So think about if, if you uh, remember back from school, from trigonometry, you had the unit circle. So here's, here's my unit circle, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, this is kind of a weird unit circle. I have to like peek around because I can't see my own screen. Uh, this is kind of a weird unit circle because this is a circle on what we call the complex plane, where we have the real axis, right? Here's the real number line. And then we have a complex, an imaginary axis, an imaginary axis. So complex numbers, you can think about them as two-dimensional numbers in a way. You have a real part and then an imaginary part. And so each complex number has a real part and imaginary part. Those could be thought of as the x and y coordinates of, of a point on the plane, right? So that's how you get the unit circle on the complex plane, right? Because you have a circle on the complex plane. Each point is a complex number because it has these coordinates, x and y. Um, OK. So, so far, so good? <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. Let's, does that make any sense to you, Amy? Yes. You, you yeah. lost me a circle. <laughs> Are you just being nice because that was an awful explanation? Or are you like, oh, no, keep going. Keep OK, going. OK. So let's go back to this guy. So let's take this formula. Mm -hmm. um, and let's do, so this is the x coordinate. And this is the y coordinate. Remember, the y was the imaginary part, and the x was the real part. So this is a real number. And because I'm multiplying this by i, it's an imaginary number. And if we put in, uh, if we put in pi, in for theta, then we have cosine of pi plus i sine of pi. And if you remember, if you remember what your trig functions are, if you remember your unit circle from trigonometry. If we go over pi radians, we land right there. You're backwards. Right back. Whoops. Wait. Oh. Oh. I'm going. Sorry. No. It's the mirror image to me. So. Uh, <laughs> right. All right. Mirror image to me. So uh, if we start at <laughs> at zero radians and go pi radians, we go halfway around the circle. Whole circle is two pi, right? We go halfway around the circle and we land right there. And so, what complex number is that? It's the complex number that has a negative 1 x value and a 0 y value, right? So the 0 is corresponding to the imaginary part. The negative 1 corresponds to the real part. And so it's just the number negative 1. That's all it is. Hmm. So nice. <laughs> e to the i pi is negative 1 if you plug it in. Yeah, now prove that. So Vince, now you can okay, share your... I can, but you won't appreciate it. <laughs> take you take sketch... the Taylor series of everything you see in this picture, right? Yes. <laughs> and show that the Taylor se the, the McLaurin series, really, right? Take the McLaurin series of both sides and show that they're actually the same. Boom. Boom. Done. Boom. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Wonderful to be and that's what's cool, right? Because you've got all those things happening, and it's just such a simple little compact formula that has all this stuff happening in it. So it is a really cool equation. Every student's favorite letter in math, an E, an I, a pi. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, Amy, we have some, um, some Q&A questions. Should we try to go over those? Yeah. I, just, I was just looking through. There are a bunch of them. Do you want to pick a couple? Yeah, uh, so the first one is math is extremely difficult for me, but I love it. I love that there's a formula for much of the world. I love that there's no arguments, at least not like with politics or other topics. How should I approach math to better my learning? That's from Lee and Burka. I, I think just embrace the difficulty. I, I think a lot of us do like it because it's hard. I, I know I do. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't think we would all do what we were doing if it came to us really easily. I mean, certainly it does come easily to some people, but then they find really hard problems to work on. Um, I think, um, I think also the, the, myth, the myth of, oh, I can't do math, and, and, and that's something that 
it, it is difficult, and I think it's difficult for everybody, even mathematicians. And I, I don't mean to sound arrogant that way, but you know, it, it is difficult. It's just it takes a lot of time to work, and it, it's just I, that's why I like it. I think with math, it's really it's a, it's a really simple equation as far as that if you put effort in, you get stuff out. Um, Whereas if I had to write a poem, I'm pretty sure I could try for a long, long time, and I'd never write a beautiful poem. But, um, but yeah, so, so math, I think, is simple but difficult. But, you know, I think there's a, a really strong analogy between learning how to write a beautiful, beautiful poem and learning how to do beautiful math. Because how do you get good at writing poems? You write a million bad ones, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. You, you fail a lot. How do you get good at, at drawing a picture? You have to draw a lot of pictures, and, and you have to draw a lot of really bad ones before you draw a really good picture. Yeah. It's yeah. for math, and people don't realize learning math means, more than any other subject, means making tons and tons of mistakes. So if you're making a lot of mistakes in a math class, that's, that's normal. That's what it's supposed to be like. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the problems we have with our educational system is that our you know we, we fear mistakes. I think we need exactly to, we need to embrace the the failure that happens with it. It's the only way to learn. Yeah. yeah, arguably it's one of the reasons why we make people do it in the first place, and so we need to embrase that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well said. I agree. Well said. Speaking of learning, there's another question on here from FSW who asks, "What math classes do PhD students take?" It, wow, I bet I bet if we put all our transcripts up on the screen, they'd all be wildly different. Interesting. Well, there there are a few classes that that almost every mathematician will take, more or less. Um, there'll, there'll be a class in algebra, and there'll be a class in analysis, right? Yeah. I mean, I think almost all all of us should have taken yep. those two classes. Well. The thing is, that's interesting, is that depending where you are, the PhD system is different. So for example, I did my PhD in the UK, and there is no taught component. It's just oh, okay. research, so there's no taught mm. component whatsoever. But um, so but, yeah. surprisingly, I I've never had a stats class in my life of any kind whatsoever. <laughs> I've never had a differential <laughs> equations class of any kind whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I took I've never had a class, class, of class of any kind whatsoever. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a PhD in geology, and I've never had a geology course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I went to grad I can't school. I can't tell you what a rock is. Came into um, our our math graduate program from philosophy, so he had a logic oh, wow. course. But... Wow. Yeah, there's, so there's going to be some common cores, but every research area has sort of a common maybe track of courses that people would take. So people in Vince's general research area probably had quite a few common courses. And, and yeah, and like complex it's very rare someone in my field to have not done a course in statistics, for example. Everyone would have done some statistics in my field. But, but you know, math, math is funny because we still, despite our, our, our differences, we still have a common language. Yeah. I think I think if if I said something, we could we could say something completely off the wall, and most of us would, would know like like um, we just talked about combing the hair on a porcupine, and the math people were like, yeah, you can't comb a hair on the hair on the porcupine. Like I, math people tend to know that term, right? Mm -hmm. If I said if I said that Pac-Man lives on the surface of a donut, you guys, you math people would know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and like that makes complete sense to you. Pac-Man lives on the surface of a donut. Yeah. Of course it does. Of course he does. <laughs> of course. Now, none of you have, have ever heard of this before, right? Nobody has told you that, that nobody clued you in on what I was going to say. You've never heard yeah. me say it, but you oh, know Pac what I mean. Oh, Pac-Man. So Pac-Man. Pac the game, like the video game, right? Slow, 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 slow. Should I, should I, should I explain that? Or should I just leave that mysterious? No, that, let's leave that for, uh, you know, that's an exercise for the, uh, the listener. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, I expect someone to make a GIF of that, a GIF of that, and post it on the Science and Google Plus page. Yes. <laughs> Do one of your professors want to explain the exercise left to a student? <laughs> oh, that, that common phrase? Yeah, that, that's the way of mathematicians that are teaching about, you know, uh, getting through the syllabus in time. Yeah, <laughs> but it's not just uh, mathematicians. I mean, in books, you you see proofs all the time that says the proof is trivial, so it's left to as yeah. an exercise. And so, 
it's, it's, I find it's generally where the professor makes a mistake. They're usually like, oh, I'll just stop here. You can figure it out from here. <laughs> and, then, and then you move on after that. But, you know, that's interesting because I think culturally there's a disconnect. When you get into a, a field like mathematics, you, you embrace that, like, oh, I'm going to go figure this out on my own and I don't need to have every detail spelled out to me, whereas that's not something that someone who's not trenched in the culturalisms of mathematics is going to be familiar with. They're used to someone showing them how all the steps and then I go I go mimic the sort of same thing. Whereas really we, we do want to be challenged to sort of go fill in the details and hope there was enough breadcrumbs to sort of find our way to where we want to go. Yeah, and, and, and what's more, I think we use regular everyday language in, in some technical ways that we don't even realize. So for example, if I said that uh, maybe I'm showing, I'm, I'm writing a proof in a seminar or something, and I say, um, it's clear that such and such is true. Um, what I don't mean is that everyone in the audience should immediately see it. What I do mean is that there's one really simple, easy step. That's what I do mean. And so that you might not see that step immediately, right? So there's this famous story, I don't even know if it's true, of G.H. Hardy, this famous English mathematician. Uh, you know, he's, he's given this, this talk doing this proof, and he says, aha, it is obvious that, and then he stops, like, dead, and then he steps back, and then he stares at the board for a few minutes, five minutes passes, and all of his students are like, what's going on? Then he walks out of the room, and then 20 minutes later, he comes back and says, aha, yes, it is obvious that. <laughs> but, like, that's such a mathematician thing to do, right? And, and we're used to that language. Yeah. Um, but but if people who don't, who don't know that way of thinking and aren't used to that culture hear that language, it makes them feel dumb. And, and quite reasonably so, right? If someone says something that's obvious and it's really not obvious to you, you're going to feel like an idiot. So to continue, and sometimes, uh, Sirius Khan asks, what's the elegance of a mathematical solution? Can you describe that term? Like an elegant mathematical solution? Yeah, like what, what constitutes mathematical elegance? In your opinion, I, I that's akin to asking what beauty is. I think it's very difficult. Yeah. Something. So well, it probably. I mean, it probably is to a degree, but we would probably agree on a lot of proofs actually that we would be elegant or not. I reckon. Well, I think we would agree on what's beautiful too. If you see it over and over again, there's going to be some fringe things that some people would think yeah. are beautiful, some would not. But yeah. it does take a while to get a sense of what that beauty is in a mathematical proof. Yeah. But you kind of have to, you kind of have to do it. <laughs> but I think it's, I think that's a tricky, I think that's a tricky thing to answer. I think a beautiful mathematical proof is going to have a, a few features. One, it's probably not going to be terribly long. Yeah. Maybe parsimony, uh, right? Partially true. And then I think it's got to capture some idea that not only proves the theorem but gives you insight into what's really going on. Because sometimes you can, and well, that's not even always true too. But I, well, cause I, I was going to say sometimes proofs I find really elegant are ones where you kind of, kind of going from A to B, but it, it looks like you're setting off in the direction of W, and then all of a sudden you're at B. You know what I'm trying to say? The surprising yeah. proofs. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, why yeah, are you I, I like that? Scene, oh, wow, you're there. Oh, that only took me two lines. That's amazing. That's you know, that, that kind of stuff. That's true. I, I really like uh, proofs that have nice pictures associated with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. Do you guys have any gifts? Any gifts that are associated with elegant proofs? I have a whole talk on such things. <laughs> <laughs> can you give that talk right now? It's well. <laughs> Must be no, but I can gift. find my slides someplace. And I stole all the pictures from someone else. So I can't take credit for any of them. But I did collect them all in one Dana, spot. Dana. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are a bunch of nice, there are a bunch of nice gifts going around for uh, the proof of uh, Pythagoras' theorem. Um, there's one where like you could see the water occupying the same area and like going into this the, the smaller rectangles. I, I I'm sure that that could be fun, but um, yeah, that was a cool a cool graphical proof of Pythagoras' theorem. So Amy, I just posted a link to some slides that have just a bunch of pictures. How much mathematics? There's, that word. there's there's a great graphical proof you can do of um, of the formula for the sum of all the numbers from one to n. I think that's my second slide. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's I do that to cool. my students every year. It's, it's 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 really slick. 
No that's what I was going to say. Whenever you use the word slick, I feel like that's an elegant uh, proof. Like when it just like it blows my mind away, and I'm like, this is so slick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Slick's a good word. Yeah. So yeah. we should probably rattle off a list of things that we do think are elegant, so someone can go look at them and sort of see an example. I think the standard proofs for the infinitude of the primes are pretty slick. I was going to bring that up. Yeah, good point. Some of the ones for the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, yeah. The square root of 2 is irrational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I'm just looking through these slides down. There's a, a bunch of awesome examples on there of some pretty slick proofs. You know, there's just one picture that that you can imagine a, a you know, first-year math student writing two pages to get the same result, you know? Um, but it can be just done with one little picture. You've got a bunch of great examples there. So are, are our listeners going to be able to click this link? Yes, I posted it in the event page. So okay, great. It is clickable. Awesome. So we've got, we were going to go until 8.30, but it's almost 8.50, but this is a really interesting <laughs> hangout, so. <laughs> so it's, not it's not 8.50, it's 1.50 in the morning. Oh, dude, come on. You keep <laughs> it. It's only 6.49. <laughs> 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 Holy cow, I'm going to need to bring my charger. <laughs> so I, I do, I want to I wanna talk about some math gifts. Now that we've, I mean, we've got mathematicians online here in a, in a real-time hangout. Do you guys have any math gifts that you find particularly interesting that you would like to share? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know where they went. <laughs> I shared mine already. Do you want me to share them again? Uh, oh, yes, if you would post the okay, link sure. in the okay. chat. Okay. I'm looking. I'm looking for the link. Uh, everyone who is watching the live stream. So if maybe someone has a gift ready, I've got one actually open on my screen that I can share. And I am hearing an echo in the hall in the uh, hangout. If everyone could make sure to be wearing headphones, that should uh, relieve the echo that's happening. So for everyone who's watching live, we were in this hangout for 45 minutes, maybe an hour, before we actually went live. Just chatting, talking about that. That's why we're being so creepy. Yes. Vincent's sound effects are completely... I need to go and get my charger, and I'll be back. Okay. So, maybe... Maybe interimly, uh, we could look at this gift that I just posted a link to in chat. I believe, Vince, you shared this one? Which one's that? Please look at chat, the most recent link that I just uh, oh, yeah. got through there. Yeah, that's, that's a cool one. That's uh. a cool one. That was actually a gift made by Philip Rue on, uh, on G+. Um, and so what you're, what you're seeing there is, um, is basically... <laughs> oh, pardon me. Should I wait, or...? No, you're fine. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so what you're seeing here... Is anybody else not seeing it? It's, it's in the link in the, in the chat. Well, yep. so we... And I just spoke about the event page. But Amy's getting it up on her screen, yeah? Oh, oh, I can do that, yeah. I was posting it onto the event page. Uh, the one that I have oh. is the Mandelbro. Let me switch. Dana, if you take, if you take a look at the group chat... Yep. Yeah. There we go. There we go. All right, we've only got we've nine only minutes got left, nine so minutes we'll go kind of quickly. Yeah. So yeah, basically, so what's happening here? Our, our, our dots are being randomly dropped randomly onto that square, square, and you're just you're just you're counting just the counting ones that are between the plot and the horizontal line. And, and what that's what doing that's is, is giving you the area the between area the plot and the horizontal line. And that's something us mathematicians are interested in. It's called an integral. And so this is actually a way of of obtaining the value of the integral. Um, called Monte Carlo simulation, and that has applications in a whole bunch of other stuff. And so it's a nice gift because it's got something really exact, which is um, uh, integration, 
and um, yeah. and something that's very stochastic, very random. Those dots. So it's a, it's a really cool game. Nice, nice. That's awesome. And then, and then Sarah, you posted a pretty cool, cool. GIF. GIF. Oh, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to pronounce this correctly. correctly. So it's a Mandel Bros set. set. So let me share this on my screen for everybody to see, and then so, I'll post it on the event page. So I think it's German and pronounced Mandel Brot. Is that right? Mandel Brot. Does anyone else know? I would imagine you guys are correct. <laughs> yeah. Mandel Brot. All this time I've been saying it wrong my whole life, just like GIF. So for um, time consideration, I think what's really cool about this one is that is the geometric uh, repetition. So basically you can zoom in into any part of these fractals and you will find the same patterns. And I think and the patterns are pretty uh, complex. So to find the same patterns over and over again, um, it's, it's, I think it's pretty amazing. And it's also amazing to see it in a GIF because you can't really... Uh, you know, you couldn't really see it. You couldn't draw draw it necessarily, or you could, yeah. but you couldn't necessarily draw it very well on a on a board or something. So, I really like this gif. No, that's a cool one. I don't know how you would even begin to draw that. <laughs> I'm just staring at well, it. Well, you would no, you would probably do a, a simpler one, like a triangle or something. Or a, a what's it called a. Um... A snowflake, the the, the, the Coke snowflake. Yeah. Right. So so Google K O C H snowflake. Coach snowflake. I believe. I believe. Yeah, the echo's back. Maybe I'm doing the echo. I know he's firmly in my ears. Coach snowflake. We maybe, while we're, maybe while we're looking for that one, uh, we could look at the so one for collective one for phenomena. phenomena. And then since we're having technical difficulties, maybe we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. But collective phenomena, it's a really Here. cool GIF. <coughs> I just put a I link up to the Coke snowflake. snowflake. Mm -hmm. There's that echo. Is this a gif, Amy? Yes. Is it not moving? No. Oh, well, it's moving on my screen really rapidly. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, <clears throat> I must have too many gifs open on various windows of my screen. So. I'll, I'll post the link to the collective <laughs> phenomena one. Uh, and to the, the Coke Snowflake in the event page. And you guys can click on it and, and check it out. Cool. Oh my gosh. I have about I have I have about a dozen GIFs running in separate windows on my computer right now. <laughs> Why? It's, it's running a little slow. So Robert, could you talk you want to talk about the collect the, the dots and waves moving through circles? No. Grumpy Cat says no. The dots and waves. So, so the, the dot is moving around the circle, right? Individually, it's just moving a little bit. But if you put a lot of these in a row, then all the dots sort of go in the same way, right? And if you put several rows together um, and have... The, the dots going around the circle just slightly in a different phase, right? Just slightly out of out of sync. Right? Each row is slightly out of sync of the other one. Then what you'll see is that uh, there'll be some kind of wave pattern going on. Right? It'll be some kind of wave pattern. So the wave moves across the screen, but um, the individual dots don't. They just kind of move around like this. And um, th that's a, sort of an example of uh, what, what we're calling collective phenomenon, and that is, the, uh, in this case, uh, just just a kind of a, a, a wavy thing going on. Um, I mean, uh, what, what, how would you describe this mathematically? Well, it's a wave. That's what we would say. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's it's a it's a periodic thing, right? And it's slightly out of phase, we say, right? Slightly 
So a periodic thing going on and another same periodic thing, but they're slightly out of phase, meaning that they're not quite synced up. That's what out of phase means. Um, and that causes these wave patterns. And, and other interesting things like, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this word, but Mavru patterns? How do you pronounce that word? Don't know. Don't know? Uh, I've, heard, I've heard of them. Yeah, so let me let me Google that one. There we go. Let's see if I can get something interesting. Yeah, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is so great. Whoop. I was trying to get Dana back on the call. Hold on. I was going to say your screen share. <laughs> yeah, I tried to. I Dana, you're full and, screen now. <laughs> I clicked on him and it took me to his profile. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Technical difficulties. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Oh. Audio. I see you though. See you though. Uh, I can't turn my camera on. It looks like I'm blocked. Oh. Uh, I don't oh, have any. The only options that I have are to mute you, eject you, or hide you from the broadcast. Eject me. <laughs> oh, All right. I'll, can I quit? Can I come back? Yeah, you, you can try that. It goes back. Oh, uh, maybe it was Dana. No, I don't think it might be me. I was, it was echoing while I was gone. <laughs> anyway, we, we've got, uh, we've no, got live you. viewers right now. We can sort out the technical <laughs> difficulty uh, maybe after. But I, I think since, since so it's now 9 o'clock, so we're going we're gonna to wrap up this hangout. Well, we're 2 o'clock a.m. I can go to sleep. Depending <laughs> on where you are. But I think we should do some more mathematics. Uh, hangout where we, where we deconstruct more of the really cool things in the world around us and think a little bit analytically. You guys can have some problem sets maybe after the next hangout. <laughs> <laughs> so on that, does anyone have any final words? words of wisdom? Uh, so I just wanted to say that if you like mathematics and you don't like teaching, uh, mathematicians can do a bunch of other things. So I'm a I'm a scientist, so I just do research. I don't teach, although I do mentor and um, I have postdocs and graduate students and everything. And um, I also have a lot of friends that work in other industries like IBM and Boeing and um, also hospitals and, and other places. So I think there's room for mathematicians everywhere. Um, and you don't really have to teach if you don't really like teaching. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, when we when we go into high schools and, and like talk to kids and try to encourage them to do math, we ask, you know, what jobs do you think a mathematician can do? And they say a teacher or an accountant. Um, but there's so many things available to mathematicians to do. Uh, so I mean, I just I was just at a an event yesterday where we had a whole bunch of people in the UK, a whole bunch of companies in the UK, come and uh, and show up jobs and like you know supermarket chains that. Do we research to try and figure out where the uh, uh, where the supermarkets need to go, and um, uh, hope you know British Airways figuring out uh, you know how many planes they need to buy and stuff like that. So there's loads of really exciting jobs out there for mathematicians, and those are just two of them. That's right. I you know I I work as a professional for Kimberly Clark as a systems analyst, and a lot of the people that I work with have mathematics degrees, and you know that's one thing about mathematicians we can wear many hats. And uh, you don't necessarily have to go into academics. And uh, if, you, if that's something that you want to pursue, like myself, as I change careers, uh, you know, that's, that's always an option. But mathematicians are very valued, and uh, uh, it's, it's something that people really need to understand. And we can do anything. We can do anything. <laughs> that's right. That's important. <laughs> We're amazing. <laughs> yeah. I agree. <laughs> Mathematicians are awesome. So on that note, we'll sign off, and we'll see you guys at the at the next Mathematics Hangout on Air with Mathematics and Science on Google Plus. This was awesome. awesome. Thanks, Amy. Hey, awesome. Thank you. Hey, we, never we had a great time. Really appreciate uh -huh. it. Bye. <laughs>